This is Dr. Kelly Bowring, and this is episode four in a 13-part series on the warning, the miracle, and the apocalypse. Episode four is on the woman of revelation and the prophetess of the end times. The Lord Jesus, when he's speaking about the final battle before the second coming, discusses five signs that we are to look for in Matthew 24. The first sign is confusion, the spread of errors which lead to the loss of faith and to apostasy. These errors are being propagated by false teachers, including renowned theologians, who are no longer teaching the truths of the gospel, but pernicious heresies based on errors and human reasonings. It's because of these errors that the true faith is being lost and that the great apostasy is spreading everywhere. The second sign Jesus speaks of is wars and catastrophes. The outbreak of wars and fratricidal struggles. While natural catastrophes such as epidemics, famines, floods, and earthquakes become more and more frequent. The third sign is persecution. The bloody persecution of those who remain faithful to Jesus and his gospel and who stand fast in the true faith. The fourth sign will be the horrible sacrilege perpetrated by him who will set himself against Christ, that is, the Antichrist. He will enter into a holy temple of God and will sit on his throne in Rome and have himself adored as God. In this abomination of the daily sacrifice will consist the horrible sacrilege accomplished by the Antichrist very shortly. The fifth sign is extraordinary phenomena which will occur in the skies. Our Lady says about this, the miracle of the sun which took place at Fatima during my last apparition there in 1917 is intended to point out to you that you are now entering into the times when those events will take place, events which prepare for the return of Jesus in glory. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, his second coming, all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and men will see the Son of Man coming upon the clouds of heaven with great power and splendor right after the three days of darkness. And so, as I was saying, this episode is about the woman of Revelation, particularly in Revelation chapter 12. We touched on this briefly in the last episode. In these times, God is sending not just another prophet like Ezekiel, or Elijah, or the 12 apostles, but because this is the most important period in the history of the world, second to the time of Christ on earth, 2,000 years ago, God is sending the most important person in the world, and if you will, even in heaven, besides himself, and that is the Blessed Virgin Mary. She is being sent by God in these times to be the prophetess of the end times, just as she prepared for the coming of the Lord the first time 2,000 years ago, God is sending her from heaven to give revelations and visions and heavenly messages to the prophets of the end times to prepare for the second coming of Christ today. And so she really is both the woman of revelation and the prophetess of the end times that I want to discuss with you today. I want to share with you what God is saying to us about these times through this prophet, Mary herself. So she says very clearly about this period and how it is the fulfillment of the book of Revelation and it is the period of the final battle. Through Father Gobi, she says, I have come from heaven to reveal to you my plan in this struggle which involves everyone. Marshaled together at the orders of the two opposing leaders, the woman clothed with the sun and the red dragon, 
that is the devil. I am announcing to you that this is the time of that decisive battle. She continues, you will see very soon the extraordinary signs which I will give. It's obviously a reference to the great miracle that's coming shortly at the Marian apparition sites throughout the world. In order that you may prepare yourselves for the very great miracle which is at this time about to be accomplished. She says, the miracle of the sun, which took place during my last apparition at Fatima, was only a prophetic sign to indicate to you that you should all look at the book, which is still sealed, the book of Revelation. She finishes, today I am being sent by God to open this book in order that the secrets may be revealed to you in the time of their unfolding. If that doesn't declare to you exactly what's going on here, both on earth and in heaven, then nothing will. Even John Paul II, the great Pope of a few years ago, when he visited the United States just before becoming Pope, prophetically said the same thing. We are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has gone through. I do not think that wide circles of the American society or wide circles of the Christian community realize this. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between life and anti-life or death. This confrontation lies in the plans of divine providence. It's a test of 2,000 years of culture and Christian civilization, and it has great consequences for all of humanity. Even Paul, in his writings, discussed very clearly what these times would be like as they're now beginning to unfold. When he said in his letters to Timothy, now the Spirit expressly says, in the latter times, some will depart from the faith by giving heed to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons through the pretensions of liars. But understand this, that in these last days, there will come times of stress where men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God holding the form of religion still, but denying the power of it. These certainly are those times. Jesus as well, in Luke 21, almost gives us a chronological unfolding of the end time event. Man-made calamities, natural disasters, signs from heaven, when he said, and when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for this must first take place. Nation will rise against nation. There will be great earthquakes in various places, famines and pestilences. There will be terrors and great signs from heaven. And upon the earth distress of nations in perplexity, at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So certainly we're in the first stages of this unfolding great battle. Wars, nations at war, earthquakes, terrors from, and signs from heaven, including the miracle of the sun at Fatima, at Medjugorje, and elsewhere. We are living in times a thousand times worse than the times of the flood. And yet God is sending the most important person in the world and in heaven, besides himself, to give us the most important message in the history of the world since the time of Christ on earth, and that is that we are in the final battle. So you can see that this began unfolding, or was most directly prophesied, when Leo XIII had that great and ominous vision and he saw Christ and Satan in the vision and Satan was arguing 
with Christ. And he said, if you give me more time and more power, I will destroy your church once and for all. And Jesus, perhaps surprisingly, said, I give you more power than you've ever had over those who will give themselves to your influence, and I give you 100 years. Now, John Paul II spoke about that vision, saying, the book of Revelation refers to the battle, recalling before our eyes the image of St. Michael the Archangel in Revelation 12. Pope Leo XIII certainly had a very vivid recollection of this scene when at the end of the 19th century, he introduced a special prayer to St. Michael throughout the church. Although this prayer is no longer recited at the end of mass in many places, John Paul said, I ask everyone not to forget the St. Michael prayer and to recite it to obtain help in the battle against forces of darkness and against the spirit of this world in these times. Now certainly, St. Michael wasn't in the vision, but Leo XIII wrote the St. Michael prayer after the vision, specifically because he understood the vision was the vision of the unfolding of the end time battle in the book of Revelation. Now, some people have recently said that there's no real indication or proof that this period lasts 100 years. Well, Our Lady at Magigoria confirmed this recently saying, one day Satan appeared before the throne of God and asked permission to submit the church to a period of trial. God gave him permission to try the church for one century, 100 years. This century is under the power of the devil. But when the secrets confided to you, the visionaries of Magigoria, come to pass, his power will be destroyed. Even now, he's beginning to lose his power and has become more aggressive. So all the heavenly prophecies of the last 400 years at least are most directly pointing to and referencing today. This 10 year decade that we're currently now beginning and in the middle of. Since the election of Pope Francis, we can officially say that prophecy indicates we are now in the final stage of the final battle of the book of Revelation. But even to discuss this from prophecy's perspective, 400 years ago in the early 1600s, the Blessed Virgin Mary was sent from heaven to visit a Catholic nun in Quito, Ecuador, named Mother Mariana de Jesus Torres. Now she's a venerable, her body is incorrupt, and she has received these church-approved private revelations from Mary under the title of Our Lady of Good Success. And Our Lady said in the early 1600s that at the end of the 20th century, in that final battle unfolding, the faithful would lose the faith and that Satan would be allowed to reign especially and specifically in that end time battle and event. Mary was speaking about exactly how he would engage in his antics, saying, the sacrament of matrimony will be attacked and profaned in the fullest sense of the word. Iniquitous laws with the objective of doing away with this sacrament, making it easy for everyone to live in sin, encouraging the procreation of illegitimate children born without the blessing of the church will run rampant. The effects of secular education will increase, which will be one reason for the lack of priestly and religious vocations in those end times. She continued about our priests and what they would go through. The holy orders of the priests will be ridiculed, oppressed, and despised. The demon will try to persecute the ministers of the Lord in every possible way. 
He will labor with cruel and subtle astuteness to deviate them from the spirit of their vocation, corrupting many of them. These corrupted priests, who will scandalize the Christian people, will incite the hatred of the bad Christians and the enemies of the church to fall upon all priests. This apparent triumph of Satan will bring enormous sufferings to the good priests of the church. The secular clergy, that's the parish and diocesan priests in general, will leave much to be desired because they will become careless in their sacred duties. Now she says about the rest of us, in these unhappy times, with unbridled luxury, the rest of the faithful will be ensnared into sin and will be conquered and lost. Innocence will almost no longer be found in children, nor modesty in women, and there will be almost no virgin souls in the whole world. Think about that. Sexual immorality, virginity, being a virgin before getting married, almost unheard of today. And then Our Lady says, in the very supreme moment of the need of the church, those who should speak will fall silent. As these heresies spread and dominate, the precious light of the faith will be extinguished in souls by the almost total corruption of Christian customs, even throughout the Christianized Western world. Also during this period, there will be great physical and moral calamities, both public and private. So already we might be wondering about what we could possibly do. We might be fretting enough to where we're thinking of despairing, especially when we look around at the world and see the reality of this prophecy already unfolding fully. And yet Our Lady gives us hope even in this sense, saying, Therefore, clamor incessantly, without tiring, and weep with bitter tears in the privacy of your heart, imploring the Father that he will have pity on his ministers and bring a quick end to those ominous times, sending to the church the Pope or prelate who will restore the spirit of the priests. A prophecy says that will be Saint Peter himself sent from heaven to guide us through this final battle after Benedict XVI dies until the second coming. But certainly in the new kingdom, in the era of peace, we will have new popes. Even more recently, Our Lady was sent from heaven to the United States of America in the 20th century under Our Lady of America, the title, which I spoke briefly about in the last video when I was at the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. She visited Saint, sorry, Sister Mary Ephraim, and this apparition has canonical approval from the local bishop and more recently from Cardinal Burke. Jesus also appeared from heaven to this sister. And let me say what he said first about families today. He said, I am not loved in the homes of men. And because I'm not loved, the divine trinity refuses to dwell therein. Children are not taught to love me because those who have charge over them have no time or patience to do so. Woe to parents who set a bad example to their children. Terrible will be their judgment. I will demand a strict account of every soul entrusted to their care. Woe to parents who teach their children how to gain materially in this world while neglecting to prepare them for the next. But woe to children who disobey and show disrespect toward their parents. 
on this shall they be judged most severely. So the fourth commandment, the responsibility of family members to one another in these times. Jesus continues, blessed are the homes that honor my name and the name of my Father. Blessed are the homes where I am loved, for the Holy Trinity dwells there. Blessed are the parents and children who have made a home for God in their hearts. So Our Lady, speaking to Sister Mary Ephraim, said, I am Our Lady of America. I desire that my children honor me, especially by the purity of their lives. She speaks of the pivotal role of the United States in the final end time battle before the second coming of Christ. In many ways, we can see the United States as the new people of God of the end times or of the last stage in this era. As the United States was discovered, we immediately consecrated this land to God, to Jesus, to Mary. We've Christianized it and we've been a witness to the rest of the world since. And so we're almost like the new promised land and the people of the promised land to be the light and witness to the world in these final end times. Our Lady seems to speak about this type of a thinking when she says, it is the United States that is to lead the world to peace. Dear children, unless the United States accepts and carries out faithfully the mandate given it by heaven to lead the world to peace, there will come upon it in all nations a great havoc of war and incredible suffering. If, however, the United States is faithful to this mandate from heaven and yet fails in the pursuit of peace because the rest of the world will not accept or cooperate, then the United States will not be burdened with the punishment about to befall the human race. Our Lady says, if my desires are not fulfilled, much suffering will come to this land. If my warnings are taken seriously and enough of my children strive constantly and faithfully to renew and reform themselves in their inward and outward lives, then there will be no nuclear war. It is the darkest hour, she says. Help me save those who will not save themselves. Such a motherly call and begging, pleading for her children and for the good children or the faithful children, we're all sinners, for the faithful children to pray for, sacrifice, reach out to in love, deliver this message from heaven through the prophetess of the end times to everyone else give them God's mercy and a chance for salvation as well. She also says about this, the remnant, there will remain a remnant untouched by the chaos, who having been faithful in following me, the mother of God, her messages from God, her motherly care, and spreading my warnings from heaven, will afterwards after the final battle. She says she's promising she'll, she'll get us through this. We'll make it through this as we place ourselves under her maternal heavenly care and that we enter into the new ark of the end times, not a ship like under Noah to get through this final spiritual flood of the final battle, but in this case, a heart, the maternal motherly heart of Mary, the mother of God. And she says, afterwards, this remnant that does that will re-inhabit the new earth with their dedicated and holy lives. So she's promising to take care of the remnant, the faithful, those that listen, those that respond, those that share the message, those that try to live it. We have her assurances. So even as we look into the 20th century at other Marian prophecies and apparitions, the most famous one, of course, being Fatima, we can see how the layers upon layers of these heavenly messages of this prophetess of the end times 
give us the full picture, the full mosaic, if you will, of the final battle and of the great victory and the second coming and the new era of peace that's unfolding in this very generation, even right now. Like at Fatima in the third secret revealed in the year 2000 publicly by John Paul II, when it was revealed to us that Mary prophesied that this final battle would be like this. The vision showed the angel of God, of God's wrath, about to strike the earth in divine punishment. Again, fatherly, remedial punishment for our sins, but to do so to help save us. And as he was about to do so, the Blessed Virgin Mary, just like in the book of Revelation chapter 12, comes down in the vision and, and, and gets in between him and the earth to slow him down, to stop him, so to say, I'm gonna intervene to help out the people of God. Father God, wait just a minute. Let me try to reach out to them. And so then the second half of the vision shows down at the earth. And it's the Pope or the, the Catholic Church and all Christians and all people of goodwill gathered together, the remnant following behind him as he steps through this rubble and debris and corpses everywhere in this city completely destroyed by war. And as they're making their way through this city, out of the city, up a hill where there's a roughly hewn wooden cross, all of a sudden the Pope and many of the people of goodwill, Christians and others, were martyred and angels came down from heaven and collected their blood, just like they did spiritually of Jesus' blood on the cross originally. And they took that blood and sprinkled it upon the masses, just like in Ezekiel's vision in the Old Testament, when he saw the valley of the dry bones of the dead, of the spiritual dead, and how the Spirit came down and re-enlivened them. So too in these end times, the prayers, the love, the sacrifices, the faithfulness, the living out of these messages from heaven, the sharing of these messages from heaven, of the remnant. God is gonna take those sacrifices, those prayers, and spiritually and bless and, and, and re-embody and re-enliven the faithful, the sinners, if you will, sorry, the sinners, the people that have given up their salvation to the ways of the world and of death, and he's gonna to help to save most of humanity through them in these end times. And that's the great plan of our times and why you are so important and why your responses right now are helping to literally save the world. And one of my favorite messages ever from heaven, and particularly from our Blessed Mother, is when she spoke at Magigoria recently and she said to each one of us, pray that you may comprehend the greatness of this message, which I am giving you, how it relates to sacred scripture, and pray to understand the signs of the times. The signs of the times is a biblical reference to the end times, to the end of the world. And Our Lady has been sent from heaven in these times. She's still appearing today to give us hope and maternal care so that we can make it through these times by reaching out to her as our mother and asking her to help us and to help guide us. Now at Magigoria, she has given and is continuing to give 10 secrets about 10 events that are about to unfold in the world. And just like at Fatima, where she gave three secrets and all three of them happened in the 20th century, and in fact, the third secret is still unfolding, she's giving 10 secrets at Magigoria for these end times. Now the visionary, Mariana, has told us a little bit about these 10 secrets. She has said that the first three secrets have to do with warnings. 
Mariana says the first two secrets, the first of which is not good and will shake us up, come as advanced warnings for the whole world and proof the Blessed Virgin Mary had been appearing in Magigoria. While the third secret concerns a permanent, indestructible, and beautiful sign that will appear in Magigoria on the hill of the first apparitions, which will remain until the end of time, which at this point will probably only be a few years until the second coming. She has said that the eighth secret is worse than the other seven, but that it has been lessened due to our prayers and fasting. The ninth secret is even worse, and the tenth secret is utterly dire and cannot be lessened whatsoever. The last seven secrets seem to relate to the seven seals of the book of Revelation. Now the visionary tries to give us a balanced understanding of all of this by saying God is love, only love, and that cruelty and evil come from Satan. Those who freely choose Satan and disobey God's commandments will perish. Punishments come for the sins of the world. So we also know that the visionaries are going to reveal each of the impending and unfolding secrets eight days before they happen to their spiritual director and then three days before they actually take place they will be announced to the whole world even before each one happens but that once they begin that is after the last of the six visionaries has received all ten secrets then they'll start unfolding and as soon as they do un begin unfolding they'll unfold one after the other fairly quickly now Our Lady has said about the indestructible sign that this sign will be given for the atheists you faithful must not wait for the sign before you convert when the sign comes it will be too late for many she says, after the visible sign, those who are alive will have little time for conversion. Hurry to be converted, Our Lady says. I need your prayers and your penance, your sacrifices, your love, your prayers for others while there's still time. She says, return to prayer. Nothing is more needed than prayer. You have forgotten that with prayer and fasting you can ward off wars, suspend natural laws, even. And so Our Lady of Magigoria and what's about to unfold will be center stage in these unfolding end times. So as we continue this episode number four on Our Lady of Revelation and the Prophetess of the End Times, there's actually an apparition of the Blessed Mother, Mother under the title of Our Lady of Revelation that took place in Rome, Italy to the visionary Bruno. Now, Bruno hated the church, he hated the Pope, and he hated the Blessed Virgin Mary. He even wrote on a dagger, death to the Pope, and was planning on killing Pope Pius XII with it. He also was preparing a talk one day in the gardens in Rome about declaring that Mary is neither virgin nor mother. And then, she appeared to him. She said, I am the one who is of the divine trinity. I am daughter of the Father, mother of the Son, and spouse of the Holy Spirit. I am the virgin of revelation. She said, pray much and recite the rosary for the consecration of sinners, of unbelievers, and of all Christians. She said, some people will not believe all this, but let that not disturb you. So eventually he had a conversion and he ended up giving the dagger as a gift to Pope Pius XII. So Our Lady of Revelation said that her sanctuaries will be for all an oasis of conversion during the purgation of the church. St. John Paul II blessed the shrine in 1997. 
So, just like at Magigoria, when Our Lady promised a miracle sign that would take place there for the conversion of the world shortly, so too she gave the same promise at other Marian shrines, like Cuenca, Ecuador, to Patricia Talbot, at Akita, when she said that there would be the sign left by her son, and most particularly at Garabandal, Spain. Our Lady appeared to the visionaries, particularly Conchita, in Garabandal, and she gave a threefold prophecy of the, of the great warning of mercy, the miracle of divine love that will take place in Garabandal and remain until the end of the world, and a divine chastisement. And so the world is in need of cleansing and conversion more than ever, and so it will come. Now, just like with Magigoria, Garabandal was supported by saints of our time, like Mother Teresa and John Paul II. So the threefold prophecy. The first is, as I've spoken about in previous episodes, the worldwide warning of purification and mercy. It will be a twofold event, one that we will see and one that we will feel. Conchita the visionary said, first a worldwide warning that will happen in the sky, like a collision of two stars that do not fall down. It will frighten all humanity regardless of where one happens to be at the time. It will be a thousand times worse than the earthquakes, like a fire that will not burn our flesh. It will last a very short time. It will be recognized as coming from God. It will resemble a punishment. It is meant to be a purification, the revelation of our sins. And so the second part is that we will all have this feeling within us, this spiritual grace of mercy. The warning, she says, comes directly from God and will be visible to the whole world from any place where anyone may happen to be. It will be like the revelation of our sins and it will be seen and felt by everyone. Believer and unbeliever, irrespective of whatever religion he may belong to, it will be seen and felt in all parts of the world and by every person. Everyone in the whole world will feel a sign, a grace, or a punishment within themselves. In other words, a warning from God. It will be the correction of our conscience, and in some ways, the conscience of the whole world. It will be the ultimate act of God's mercy. Just as he promised through other saints, most particularly through Saint Faustina. And we know that it will occur in our lifetime and while Benedict XVI is still alive. The second of the threefold prophecy is the great miracle and permanent sign of God's love that will take place in Garabandal, just like in Magigoria. We know about it, the miracle, that it will take place within one year after the warning. It will be on a Thursday night at 8.30 p.m. It will be pre-announced by Conchita eight days prior to it happening. It will take place on the feast day of a martyred saint of the Eucharist in March, April, or May between the 7th and the 17th of the month. The sick will be cured and unbelievers will be converted. So we will receive God's gift of mercy and love before his justice. So the divine chastisement is the third of the threefold prophecy of Garabandal. Conchita said about it, I cannot reveal what kind of punishment it is, except that it will be a result of the direct intervention of God, which makes it more terrible and fearful than anything we can imagine. 
It will be less painful for innocent babies to die a natural death than for those babies to die because of the punishment. All Catholics should go to confession before the punishment, and others should repent of their sins. When I saw it, I felt a great fear, even though at the same time I was seeing our Blessed Mother. The punishment, if it comes, will come after the miracle. And then she later added about this. The chastisement cannot be avoided because we have lost even the meaning of sin in our times. Other mystics and saints, especially of recent times, have also given some of the details about these coming events within the church, the upheavals within the church, the chastisements of God, and why we're going to receive them. For example, Jesus, speaking through the mystic, Luisa Picaretta, said, The church is so full of interior bitterness, and in addition to the interior bitterness, she's about to receive exterior bitternesses. I see people starting a revolution, entering churches, stripping altars, breaking statues. While they're doing this, I, the Lord, am sending more scourges from heaven, and many are killed. Luisa, the visionary, said, I saw many priests running away from the church and turning against the church to wage war against her. How many religious pretend to be my children, Our Lady said to Luisa, while they're the fiercest enemies of the church. These false sons are usurpers, self-interested and incredulous. Their hearts are bilges of vice. These very sons will be the first to wage war against the church. They will try to kill their own mother. Oh, how many of them are already about to come out into the field. Now there is war among governments and countries, but soon they will make war against the church, and her greatest enemies will be her own children. She said, you too, Unite yourselves to my motherly sorrow. Pray and be patient in watching this storm pass by. So all of this reminds us of that most famous dream of the mystic saint, Saint John Bosco, when he had this vision, an allegory about the end times and what would happen to the Catholic Church the mothership, if you will, of all the churches and Christians and peoples of goodwill in the world in these end times. And so we know about this vision that on the whole surface of the sea, John Bosco saw many, many ships in the midst of a great storm. In the middle of all of this were two great, very tall columns. On one of them was the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary with a title called Help of Christians. On the other one, even bigger and taller, was the statue of a Eucharistic host of Jesus with the words on the column that said, Salvation of Believers. And there were chains with anchors on both columns for the ships to attach themselves to. Well, the mother ship in the midst of this storm was all of a sudden in the midst of a battle, was under attack while the Pope captained the ship at the helm. And every time the mother ship would get attacked by cannonballs from the other enemy ships in this battle, a breeze would blow from the two columns from the Eucharist and Our Lady and that was enough to heal every wound and close up the holes until eventually the enemy got desperate and lined up along the mothership and then climbed on board to engage in combat within the ship, within the church 
herself. Now, St. John Bosco says in this dream, and he later confirmed in detail, which many people aren't aware, but I found in my research, that this has to do with three popes. And so the vision goes. One pope falls because he had been gravely wounded, but then he rises again. Uh, by all accounts, that's Pope John Paul II, who was wounded on May 13, 1981. And then the vision goes that then a second pope is wounded again, and this time falls and dies. Now, according to all prophecy related to this, that is Benedict the 16th. And then finally, there will be, after all of this, a new conclave and a new pope will be elected. Now in the midst of that, prophecy says St. Peter himself will guide the church in between Benedict's death and the new great renewal of the era of peace. So after the two popes are struck, wounded, and then struck and martyred, all of a sudden the vision shows a total disorder breaks out. Over the whole order of things, the, the boats, the sea, the storm, the battle, until eventually the Pope, the new Pope, guides the mothership between the two columns and anchors her up. And the other ships that are still afloat, that have survived the battle in the storm, all gather around and anchor up between the two columns and the mothership. And finally there is calm in the seas. The battle ends with the great victory of the church and of Our Lady and the Eucharist, and the new era begins. And so does that not summarize all the prophecies we are discussing here and all that is still unfolding? The church now and then was and has been suffering great damages, especially, we could say, since Vatican II in many ways. Not because of Vatican II itself, but because many deceiving the church and her members in a false spirit misused the documents and teachings of Vatican II and led many into error. And so most of those damages were repaired, just as the vision said, but now we're about to see the all-out war, the complete outbreak and eventually, very shortly, the martyrdom of a pope, probably Benedict. Even Our Lady, in speaking to the mystic Father Gobi, confirms all of this in a different way, saying, I now announce to you that the time of the great trial has come. The apostasy and the great schism in the church is on the point of taking place and the great chastisement. And then in detail, fire will come down from heaven and a great part of humanity will be destroyed. Those who survive will envy the dead because everywhere there will be desolation, death, and ruin. In order to be protected and saved, you must all enter right away into the safe refuge of my immaculate heart, she says. She continues, Because this humanity has not accepted my repeated call to conversion, to repentance, to a return to God, there is about to fall upon it the greatest chastisement which the history of mankind has ever known. It is a chastisement much greater than of the flood. In appearance, she continues, everything remains calm and seems like all is going well. In reality, the church is being pervaded with an overwhelming lack of faith, which is spreading the greatest apostasy everywhere. For this reason, the church must be purified with persecution and with blood. The flock of Christ will be torn to pieces by rapacious wolves who have found their way in under the clothing of defenseless and meek lambs. 
Satan has succeeded in entering and in operating at the very summit of the church. The activity of my adversary to extend his reign over all humanity will become stronger. Thus evil and sin, violence and hatred, perversion and unbelief will increase everywhere. This is what it's coming down to. This is what's already unfolding. Even some of our recent heroes of the Catholic faith understood and prophesied about this. For example, Fulton Sheen, in his book, Communism and the Conscience of the West, spoke a prophecy about how the church would eventually have a false prophet, Pope, who would prepare the way for the Antichrist. He said, Satan will set up a counter church. It will have all the characteristics of the church, but in reverse, and emptied of its divine content. We are living in the days of the apocalypse, the last days of our era. The two great forces, the Church of Christ and the Anti-Church of the Antichrist, are beginning to draw their battle lines. The false prophet, he says, will have a religion without a cross, without a world to come, a religion to destroy religions, this will be the counter church. Christ church, the Catholic church, versus the false prophets, as he takes over the visible external Catholic church, will form the counter church. The false church will be worldly, ecumenical, global, a world federation of churches, if you will. The Catholic Church will have its Judas Iscariot, and he will be the false prophet. Satan will recruit him from our bishops. He will build the Antichurch in preparation for the Antichrist. He will say there is no heaven, no hell, no sin, no judge or judgment. Thus evil is good, and good is evil. The Antichrist will fool, fool so many that he will deceive even the elect, as Jesus himself warned. And so even Paul in Scripture gives us that prophecy about the Antichrist in his second letter to the Thessalonians, saying, The son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, will take his seat in the temple of God. Now by all prophecy, that is Rome, not Jerusalem, as many Protestants misunderstand. Continuing, Paul says, he will proclaim himself to be God, and the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by his appearing and his coming at the second coming. The coming of the lawless one by the activity of Satan will be with all power and with pretended signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are to perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. In other words, Paul says it's in God's providence, it's the last great test to draw the line between the wheat and the chaff, the sheep and the goats. Another great prophecy matching all of this together but putting another layer of information and detail and confirmation is that famous prophecy of St. Francis of Assisi, which was documented and written in a famous book about him in 1882 in which Francis said just before dying, at the time of the great tribulation, a man not canonically elected, now we know a lot about that from the St. Gallen Mafia, that particularly the election of Pope Francis was by all investigative accounts invalid. So again, back to Francis's prophecy, a man not canonically elected will be raised to the pontificate who by his cunning 
will endeavor to draw many into error and death. The scandals will be multiplied and many will consent to error instead of opposing it. There will be such diversity of opinions and schisms among the people, the religious, the clergy, that except those days be shortened, according to the words of the gospel, even the elect would be led into error. Were they not specially guided amid such great confusion by the immense mercy of God. The elect or the remnant will suffer injuries and persecutions and be labeled by the deceptors and instigators as rebels and schismatics. And amidst all of this, some will keep silent about the truth and others will trample it underfoot and deny it. Holiness itself will be held in derision by those who outwardly profess it. And then he ends with the most famous, most poignant prophecy. For in those days our Lord Jesus Christ will send them not a true pastor, but a destroyer. So all of this brings us to the most famous and most direct prophecies recognized by the church, even as recently as 2002 with an imprimatur, and that is Our Lady's prophecies through La Salette. When she said, the earth will be struck by calamities of all kinds, the last war will commence. It will be fought by the ten kings of the Antichrist, all of whom will have one and the same plan and will be the only rulers of the world. Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist, which the false prophet Pope is preparing, according to prophecy, right now. Lastly, hell will reign on earth it will be then that the Antichrist will rise and many will believe in him because he will claim to have come from heaven. And woe to those who believe in him. The demons with the Antichrist will perform great wonders on the earth and in the air. And men will corrupt themselves more and more. God will have care of his faithful servants and men of goodwill. The gospel will be preached everywhere. All peoples and all nations will have knowledge of the truth. But the church, the Catholic church, will be eclipsed. The world will be in consternation. Now, about that last point, the church being eclipsed, Melanie, the visionary of La Salette, discuss two points of what Our Lady meant by that. First, she said, and I quote, during that time we will not know which is the true Pope. In other words, there'll be more than one alive who will look like the Pope, similar to what's going on today between Benedict and Francis. Secondly, she said, the holy sacrifice of the Eucharist will cease to be offered in churches and also in houses. So there will be no more public worship of the Eucharist. But she says it will not cease altogether. It will continue in barns and in alcoves and in caves and in tunnels. In other words, in what we might call the underground church. Our Lady said, there will be bloody wars and famines, pestilences and contagious diseases. There will be thunders that strike cities, earthquakes that engulf countries. Voices heard in the air, men will beat their head against the walls. They'll call upon death. And on another side, death will be their torture. Blood will flow on all sides. 
Who will be able to overcome if God does not shorten the time of this ordeal? By the blood, the tears, the prayers of the just, God will let himself be swayed. Fire from heaven will fall and consume cities. All the universe will be struck with terror and many will let themselves be misled because they have not adored the true Christ living among them, especially the Eucharist. The sun will darken and faith alone will be our only hope. Behold the time, she says, the abyss opens. Behold the kings of darkness. Behold the king of kings of darkness. Behold the beast with his subjects calling himself the savior of the world. He will raise himself up with pride into the air in order to even go up to heaven. And then Jesus will come through the three days of darkness and put an end to the Antichrist and the false prophet and bring the era of peace. So even Saint John Paul II confirmed La Salette, Fatima, all these prophecies, if you will, when he said, if victory comes, it will be brought by Mary. Christ will conquer through her because he wants the church's victories now and in the future to be linked to her. I can see, he said, there's a certain continuity among La Salette, Lords, and Fatima, between La Salette, Lords, and Fatima. That's John Paul II confirming all of these prophecies. So Our Lady speaking about all these details about the abomination that's going to be set up in Rome and the abolishment of the true Eucharist in the official public Catholic Church said again through Father Gobi. Now from the moment the daily sacrifice is abolished and the horrible abomination is set up by the Antichrist and the false prophet, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits with patience and attains 1,335 days. And of course, Our Lady is in that quote through Father Gobi, citing Daniel chapter 12, which was also the biblical prophecy about the end time abolishment of the Eucharist, the sacrifice. And then God will come and send the divine chastisement to stop the evil of the Antichrist. And so, about the three days of darkness, Our Lady said at La Salette, the Antichrist will be smothered by the breath of the holy archangel Michael. He will fall in the earth, which for three days will be in continual evolutions, will open its bosom full of fire. He will be plunged forever with all his own into the eternal chasms of hell. Then water and fire will purify the earth and will consume all the works of the pride of men and all will be renewed. God will again be served and glorified. And again, that's as we enter the great era of peace that Our Lady of Fatima said in the end would happen on the other side of this great battle. So it's interesting, just before he resigned, Benedict XVI canonized or beatified Blessed Elena, a mystic of the 20th century. And also he decided to make a new doctor of the church, and that is St. Hildegard. Now what's interesting is that St. Hildegard's most famous prophecies are about the Antichrist. And Blessed Elena's 1960s prophecies is about the times we're talking about here as well. Let me quote. The Blessed Mother speaking through Blessed Elena said, launch forth into the world a message to make known to all that the scourge is near at hand. The justice of God is weighing upon the world Mankind, defiled in mire, soon will be washed in its own blood by disease, famine, earthquakes, cloudbursts, tornadoes, floods, terrible storms, and by war. 
If men do not amend their ways, a terrible, terrifying scourge of fire will come down from heaven upon all the nations of the world. And men will be punished according to the debts contracted by divine justice. She continued saying, Clouds of lightning, flashes of fire in the sky, and a tempest of fire shall fall upon the world. This terrible scourge, never before seen in the history of humanity, will last 70 hours. In other words, the three days of darkness. Godless persons will be crushed and wiped out. So that's the opposite of this kind of notion that the good will go first and the bad will be left behind that some Protestant groups teach that has no sense of truth in Catholic prophecy. In this sense, we know that three days of darkness will be the godless persons crushed and wiped out. Many will be lost because they remain in their obstinacy of sin. Then shall be seen the power of light over the power of darkness. And she says at this point, see how Russia will burn. So constantly Our Lady is asking for the conversion of Russia and some people mistakenly think that it's already been converted. In a sense, not at all. Listen to Our Lady through Blessed Elena. She said, Russia will march upon all the nations of Europe, particularly Italy, and will raise her flag over the dome of St. Peter's. Italy will be severely tried by a great revolution and Rome will be purified in blood for its many sins, especially of impurity. The flock is about to be dispersed and the true Pope will suffer greatly. So this is the prophecy of Benedict, uh, who, who Benedict beatified of Blessed Elena. And this is what's now unfolding in our times. So what are we to do? Our Lady herself always gives guidance in a motherly way. She says, spread the devotion of my immaculate heart in order that many souls may be conquered by my love and that many sinners may return to my maternal heart. Do not fear, for I will accompany with my maternal protection my faithful ones the remnant, if you will, and all those who accept my urgent warnings, and they, especially by the recitation of my rosary, will be saved, will be saved. So there is our hope in these times. So the Blessed Mother continuing to give overlapping detail and confirmation through another prophecy said almost the same thing, but in a new way and detail, through a Catholic nun. And she said this through Our Lady of Akita to Sister Agnes, who during the apparitions had the very wounds of Christ in her body, the stigmata. And in the 1970s, the Blessed Mother said through Sister Agnes at Akita, First, about the turmoil within the church. With the rosary, pray for the Pope, the bishops, and the priests. The work of the devil will infiltrate even into the church in such a way that we will see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishops against other bishops. The priests who venerate me will be scorned and opposed. The churches and altars will be sacked the church will be full of those who accept compromises. And the demon will press many priests and consecrated to leave the service of the Lord. The demon will rage especially against souls consecrated to God. If sins increase in number and gravity, there will no longer be pardon for them. Our Lady said the only arms which will remain for you will be the rosary and the sign, the great miracle sign, left by my son. 
So about the end time divine chastisement, Our Lady of Akita also gave detail. She said, as I told you, if men do not repent and better themselves, the Father will inflict a terrible punishment on all humanity. It will be a punishment greater than the deluge, such as one will never have seen before. Fire will fall from the sky and will wipe out a great part of humanity, the good as well as the bad, sparing neither priests nor faithful. The survivors will find themselves so desolate they will envy the dead. They will envy the dead. So many people have so forgotten or abandoned or ignored or even rejected these messages from heaven being given by the woman of Revelation, the prophetess of the end times, the Blessed Mother herself. That even Jesus came and the church recognized apparitions of heed Germany to the visionary Greta bemoaning all of this saying man did not listen to my most holy mother when she appeared to them at Fatima and admonished them to do penance now I myself am coming at the last hour to warn and admonish mankind these times are very serious men should at last do penance turn away from their sins and pray pray much in order that the wrath of God may be mitigated. Particularly the Holy Rosary should be prayed very often. The Rosary is very powerful with God. Worldly pleasures and amusements should be restricted. Mankind is worse than before the deluge. Mankind is suffocating in sin. Hatred and greed rule their hearts. This is the work of the devil. They live in great darkness. But mercy will again gain victory over justice. My faithful soul shall not, should not be asleep. Now, like the disciples at Mount Olivet, when I was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Instead, they should pray without ceasing and gain all they can for themselves and for others. Tremendous things are in preparation. It will be terrible as never before since the foundation of the world. All those who in these grave times have suffered so much, the faithful, the remnant, the victim souls, Jesus says are martyrs and form the seed for the new church that is coming. He continues, the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the choirs of angels will be active during these happenings. Hell believes that it has the sureness of its harvest, but I will snatch it away from them. I will come with my peace. With a few faithful, I will build the new kingdom. As a flash of lightning, this kingdom will come much faster than mankind realizes. I will give you, the faithful remnant, a special light to make it through these times. And so, yeah, this is, even Jesus himself trying to come and say, listen to this message. It's true. It's really happening. Is anybody awake? Is anybody listening? Will anybody respond? If Mary, if not to Mary, then even to Jesus himself? So Our Lady is specifically asking the church to pray through her to the Lord God as she is an intercessor by the very will of God. And she spoke about this in detail in the church approved apparitions in Amsterdam of Our Lady of All Nations to the visionary Ida. When she said, Mary said, the Lady of All Nations, Mary, wishes for unity in the true Holy Spirit. The world is covered by a false spirit, by Satan, but I have come from heaven to request a new dogma of co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocates. Then the Lord appeared to the visionary Ida and said, the Holy Father, the Pope, 
will proclaim her co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. And he said, do fight for this dogma. And Our Lady gave us reason why. She said, through this dogma, God is preparing a new era of grace, redemption, and peace that will save the world from this end time period of degeneration, disaster, and war. And so, let it be. Let us fight for it. Let us pray for it. Our Lady herself gave a prayer from heaven so that we could ask for this dogma and ask for her intercessory motherly power in prayer. And she said, about this prayer. In this new era, which is now about to unfold, I wish to be known as the Lady of all peoples, who once was Mary, but is now our Lady of all peoples for everyone in the new era. Remember, she'll be Queen of all 12 nations in the new era, of every single person. And we know because of the wisdom and light and grace of God that everyone at that time will finally and directly and consciously honor her as such. In the meantime, we pray the prayer she gave us to help bring this about. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, send now your Spirit over the earth. Let the Holy Spirit live in the hearts of all nations that they may be preserved from degeneration, disaster, and war. May the Lady of all nations, who once was Mary, be our advocate. Amen. And amen, right? So Our Lady also confirmed that she is to be called Mediatrix of Grace in the apparitions recognized by the Church to the visionary Barbara at Marienfried in Germany. So the Blessed Mother, speaking about all this through Barbara, said, I will spread peace. I print my sign on the forehead of my children. I am the powerful mediatrix of graces. Have unreserved confidence in my immaculate heart. Believe that I am able to do everything with my son. The world will have to drain the cup of wrath to the dregs because of the countless sins through which his heart is offended. Satan will rage more violently than ever and will cause frightful destruction because he knows that his time is short. The devil has power over all people who do not trust in my heart, she says. I am the powerful mediatrix of grace. It is the will of the Father that the world acknowledges this. God wants it so. In secret, I shall work marvels in souls until the required number of victim souls will be filled. Upon you, it depends to shorten the days of darkness. Your blood and your sacrifices shall destroy the image of the beast. Then I can manifest myself to the world for the glory of the Almighty. Pray and offer sacrifices through me. Pray always. Pray the rosary. Make all of your prayers to the Father through my Immaculate Heart. If you consecrate yourselves without reserve, I shall take care of all the rest. Crosses weighty and deep as the sea I shall lay upon my children because I love them in my sacrificed son. I beseech you, she says, be prepared to carry the cross that peace may soon be achieved. So then Our Lady speaking through the visionary Bernardo in Cuopa, Nicaragua in the 1980s said Our Lady said renew the first Saturday devotion that I gave you at Fatima 
You received many graces when you did this. If you don't change, you will hasten the coming of the Third World War. Of the Third World War. And remember, as we said earlier, Our Lady of America said that it could very well be a nuclear war. So Mary says, say this prayer at Quopa. Saint Mary of Victory, favorite daughter of God the Father, give me your faith. Mother of God the Son, give me your hope. Sacred Spouse of God the Holy Spirit, give me your charity and cover us with your mantle. Holy Virgin, you are my mother, the mother to all of us sinners. Amen. Amen. And then Mary speaks about the flame of love that she wants to spread throughout her devout children to help save the world. This, this love she speaks about through the visionary Elizabeth in Budapest. And she says, my flame of love is burning. It is so great that I cannot keep it any longer within me. When it pours out onto you, it will destroy the satanic hatred that contaminates the world. The greatest number of souls will be set free. Nothing like this has ever existed before. This is my greatest miracle that I will do for all. Take this flame. It's the flame of the love of my heart. Ignite your heart with it and pass it on to others. So the visionary Elizabeth asked Mary, what is the flame of love? And Mary and Jesus both answered. And Jesus said, the flame of love of my mother is for you what the ark was for Noah. So Mary's heart is the ark, as we said earlier, of safety, protection, and hope that God is giving us to get us through this final storm, this final spiritual flood, this final battle between now through the period of the false prophet and the Antichrist until we get to the second coming and the era of peace. And Mary said, the flame of love of my immaculate heart is Jesus Christ himself, is Jesus Christ himself. She said, help me. My flame of love being lit depends on you. She says, the elect souls will have to fight the Prince of Darkness and it will be a frightening storm. No, not a storm, but a hurricane devastating everything. He even wants to destroy the faith and confidence of the elect. I will always be beside you in the storm that is now brewing. I am your mother. I can help you and I want to. You will see everywhere the light of my flame of love sprouting out like a flash of lightning, illuminating heaven and earth, and with which I will inflame even the dark and languid souls. But what sorrow it is for me to have to watch so many of my children throw themselves into hell. My children, she says, the arm of my divine son is ready to strike. I can barely hold it back. Help me. If you invoke the flame of love of my immaculate heart, she says, we can save the world together. And that is ultimately what this is all about. The remnant faithful, those hearing this, listening, watching right now, being among those who will help the Blessed Mother sent by God as the woman of Revelation and the prophetess of the end times to literally be the apostles of the last times to help save the world, to help spread this last message from God to the human race to save the world and to offer their lives in sacrifice, in prayer, and in faithfulness throughout this entire battle. Holding on, entering into, 
loving through the rosary, the Immaculate Heart of Mary. What Jesus Christ himself, God himself and his son said is the new ark of safety, protection and love in these end times. And so we pray with that in mind, Hail Mary, full of grace, flood the whole of humanity with the graces of your flame of love. Amen, amen. Even in the United States, in the church approved apparitions of Our Lady of Good Help, to the visionary Adele, Our Lady talked about the idea that we have to get involved. She said, I'm the queen of heaven who prays for the conversion of sinners. And I wish you, you, to do the same. If they do not convert and do penance, my son will be obliged to punish them. And that's what it's about. Let us ward off the divine chastisement and punishment, at least in part, by offering up our prayers and sacrifices and penances and love, living these messages and spreading them to others. Our Lady truly did say that in these times, and the most famous Marian prophecy in history, through Saint Dominic, that by way of the scapular and the rosary, she said, I will save the world, the world. Our Lady speaking about what's coming on the other side of this battle to give us hope even today talking about this, said through Father Gobi, thus you are already contributing to the forming of the new Jerusalem, the holy city, which must come down from heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. And, and then the Holy Spirit will work the new miracle of universal transformation in the heart and the life of all. Sinners will be converted, the weak will find support. The sick will receive healing. Those far away will return to the house of the Father. Those separated and divided will attain full unity. In this way, the miracle of the second Pentecost will take place. It will come with the triumph of my Immaculate Heart in the world together with the new Eucharistic reign of my Son, Jesus Christ. The triumph of the Immaculate Heart, the Eucharistic reign of the heart of Jesus, it's all coming on the other side of this battle. Our Lady continues through Father Gobi. And then the sacred heart of Jesus Christ will bring his glorious reign into the new world. The glorious reign of Christ will be established after the complete defeat of Satan and all the spirits of evil and the destruction of Satan's diabolical power. The glorious reign of Christ will bring all humanity back to the state, watch this, listen to this, back to the state of our terrestrial paradise. That's what we said in the previous episode, episode three, about the new kingdom, the new era of peace, the new Jerusalem. It will be the, the new paradise. It will be the complete universal transformation, the new heavens and the new earth where we live in a thousand year era of peace, together with the triumphant Immaculate Heart of Mary and the new Eucharistic reign of Jesus Christ. Mary continues, and all creation, all creation, will become again that marvelous garden created for man to reflect in a perfect manner the greatest glory of God. That which is being prepared is so great that its equal has never existed since the creation of the world. So it's gonna be even greater, better, more wonderful, more perfect than even the Garden of Eden before the original sin. And that's what's coming. All of this, as we get to our final thoughts today, all of this depends upon you and I. Mary is calling out to us, the prophetess of our end times, the woman of revelation, to call upon her spiritual children to go out into the desert to fight, to pray, to sacrifice, to offer our lives in union with her heart to help save the world. Our Lady said through Father Gobi, these evils can be avoided by you. The dangers can be evaded. Everything at any moment may be changed by the force of your prayer 
and your penances. And one of, again, one of my most famous messages from heaven in these times from Our Lady through Magigoria, really speaking to our hearts, to your heart, certainly to my heart, is when she says, I want you to comprehend that God has chosen each one of you in order to use you for the great plan of the salvation of mankind. You cannot comprehend how great your role is in God's plan. There are many plans that I cannot fulfill without you. I cannot do anything without you. Therefore, dear little children, pray that you may comprehend the greatness of this message which I am giving you from heaven. And so what is the most important thing that we are to do? To summarize all of this message about what Our Lady in heaven and God is asking us to do. Unite ourselves to the Immaculate Heart. Fight this battle to crush the head of Satan and the dragon. And do so by the great weapon, as St. Pio called it, praying the rosary every day of our lives is the highest priority, no matter what's going on. And doing so because we know that we've been called to help in these end times, as the apostles of the end times, to save souls and literally to save the world. Our Lady, talking about this through Father Gobi, said, Satan's pride will again be conquered by the humility of the little ones. And the red dragon will find himself decisively humiliated and defeated when I bind him, not by a great chain, but by the very frail cord of the Holy Rosary. The Holy Rosary is a chain that has three functions. First, it limits Satan's actions. Second, it imprisons him. And third, it makes ineffective every activity of his and literally binds him to it and casts him back into hell. She says it makes Satan completely harmless and wins, t and wins for us the great victory. Did you know that when Mother Teresa founded the Missionaries of Charity. She literally received an apparition of Mary. And in that apparition, Mary summarized the message of the end times, saying, Fear not, fear not. Listen, after all this message, fear not. Teach everyone to say my rosary, especially in families, the family rosary, and then all will be well. That's Mary's message. That's the end time message. That's it in summary. So powerful is this rosary as the weapon, greater than atomic bombs that the visionary of Fatima, Sister Lucia, said about it under Mary's guidance. The Most Holy Virgin in these last times in which we live has given a new efficacy to the recitation of the rosary to such an extent that there is no problem, no matter how difficult it is, whether temporal or above all spiritual, in the personal life of each one of us, of our families, of the families of the world, or of even religious communities, or of even in the life of peoples and nations that cannot be solved by the rosary. Nothing else. It's that simple. It's that specific. It's that direct. There's no other message. She continues, there is no problem, I tell you, no matter how difficult it is, that we cannot resolve by the prayer of the Holy Rosary. With it, we will save ourselves, we will sanctify ourselves, we will save others, and we will save the world! We will save the world and obtain the salvation of many, many souls. 
And so we come down to it, the remnants, the children of Our Lady now, which hopefully every one of you is from this moment forward. The apostles of the latter times, that even St. Louis de Montfort, in his true devotion to Mary, spoke prophetically about us. And he said this about you, about you listening right now, watching right now. You end time saints, the great saints of the end times will surpass most of the other saints in the history of the world. In sanctity, full of grace and zeal, you shall be chosen to match yourselves against the enemies of God who will rage on all sides. You will be singularly devoted to our Blessed Lady, illuminated by her light, strengthened by her nourishment, led by her spirit, supported by her arm, sheltered under her protection. And you shall fight overthrow and crush the heretics with their heresies, the schismatics with their schisms, the idolaters with their idolatries, and the sinners with their impieties. And you shall draw the whole world to true devotion to Mary. Because it is through Mary that the salvation of the world was begun, and it is through Mary that it will be consummated, in order that through her, Jesus Christ may be known, loved, and served once again as we enter into these new times. God then, St. Louis de Montfort says, wishes to reveal and make known Mary, the masterpiece of his hands in these latter times. And that's what Our Lady of La Salette, Mary herself says to the remnant faithful who will live in devotion to her to help save the world. She actually literally calls us, and I quote, the apostles of the last days. She says, we are the faithful disciples of Jesus Christ who will live in scorn for the world and for ourselves, in poverty and humility, in prayer and in mortification, in chastity and in union with God, in suffering and unknown to the world. But it is time you come out and fill the world with light. Mary says, fight, children of the light, of the light, fight. You, the few who can see, she says, for now is the time of all times and the battle of all battles. Amen. So as we said all along, this is what Our Lady is asking of us. She says at Magigoria, dear children, if you only knew how great my love for you is, you would cry with joy. May she give us that grace to know her love and the love of her son through her. She says, live my messages, live these messages and put into life every word that I am giving you. May they be precious to you because they come from heaven. Amen. So I thank you for listening to these words from heaven through the Blessed Virgin Mary and understanding her role in these times, these end times specifically, as the book of Revelation prophesied to be the woman of Revelation and the heavenly prophetess of the end times. I cannot even express to you how much suffering that I have endured and how difficult you know, the spiritual battle it's been to communicate this message, first by trying to live it and then by reporting on it to you today, but all for the glory of God. And I say this to you because I'm asking for us to unite together in prayer. Please let us pray for one another as I pray for you. Please pray for me for this work, for this message from heaven and the rest of this 13 part series on the end times and Catholic prophecy. Pray that this spe special message from heaven spreads and that you have the strength and courage and the grace and Our Lady's presence to spread this message. The Lord Jesus Christ to guide you according to his will so that we can help together to save souls and save the world with Jesus and Mary. If you can, please also, besides praying, consider giving a financial donation if you're able to do that, please go to our website, Two Hearts Press, 
twoheartspress.com and in the right column there's a, a box that allows you to give a donation. So let us pray together our last prayer. Come Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. Amen. To make sure you receive notice of the remaining videos in this series, fo series follow me on YouTube at Two Hearts Press Channel and on Facebook at Kelly Bowring. This is Catholic theologian Dr. Kelly Bowring signing out. God bless you, my friends. See you next episode. Peace.